and I'll have you take it away, Adriano. Thanks, Danny, for the, the introduction and, you know, for being awesome. <laughs> um, well, um, I'm going to talk mostly about my PhD. Uh, this research was done from 2015 to the field work was done from 2015 until 2017. And the analysis and everything came after. Right, so the title is The Effect of 11KT, which is uh, uh, an androgen, and prolactin on gene expression, parental care behavior, and immune response in bluegill. What I, what I, I structured, oops, I structured this talk into basically two types of content. One of them is the science itself, and the other is something that I wish, uh, I wish I had when, when I was, when I was attending these lectures here, which is more like the personal experience with with your PhD. This I hope this gives a little bit of color and helps someone. I, I, I it took me eight years to finish my PhD. For four years I was there, and then I realized that uh, things were, were not moving as fast as I wanted. So I went back to teaching. That's what I do. I, I'm, I see myself as a teacher and everything else was something like for fun. And, uh, um, and then after, after seven and a half years, I ended up switching supervisors. And then one month after I switched the supervisor, I got another paper published. And three months, I got my thesis submitted and, and I defended soon after. So this is kind of like the emotional uh, part of the PhD, but then let's go to the science. So I'll talk about trade-offs. Uh, I use fish as a model, I'll tell you why. And then I, I, I structured in a way that I'll have hormones linked to behaviors, hormones linked to gene expression, and finally, hormones and the immune response, right? So there were three studies and I mentioned that they were done in about 2015 to 2017, because in a way they are dated. One of them is dated and I'll tell you why. So uh, what we have here is the first thing we're talking about, uh, I'll talk about trade-offs, right? So how can organisms allocate resources in the best way possible? We this is the this is one of the the this is the theory that we started uh, that I started the PhD with. So, if you have competing interests or or competing behaviors, such as we have in this fish, so this fish they build nests. The females just lay their eggs and they leave, and the males will stay and take care of the, the eggs for up to 10 days. So they have to take care of the eggs, and they, they have to protect the eggs, and they have to exhibit some nurturing behaviors, oxygenating the eggs, cleaning up uh, uh, mold, and... Uh, that that's pretty much it, right? So we 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 set we separated behaviors into aggressive and nurturing, right? So here you see a bluegill, you see that it has uh, it it's on top of his nest, and they don't leave, they don't eat, so they lose weight. It's a very uh, demanding situation, right? And if I if I the way I, I let's say my focus was in the immediate causation. I was not worried about evolution or even though, of course, we know that is like the grammar of biology, but we were worried about like the immediate interactions with the environment, right? Uh, this is a picture of cubes. Cubes is in uh, Northern Ontario. It's close to Kingston. 
is a research facility that sometimes has a hundred and something uh, PhDs, masters, and undergrads. And this lake was the lake that they discovered in the eighties. The let's say they described the specific the specificities of bluegill, right? So that it builds nests. Uh, the influence of the hormones on their behavior and uh, things like that, let's say. So uh, you can see that I'm the guy that was born in Brazil, hot weather, cool weather, and thought, I'll go to Canada and swim early spring when the weather outside was like zero degrees. Um, we would monitor the lake for an hour. There was a team. And uh, basically, we would spend an hour swimming and trying to find the, the nests. We normally find not one nest, but we find a colony. Sometimes there are 40 nests all together, which helps our work, right? Um, and then we would spend early summer late spring and early summer in this uh, facility. This is one of the swimmers. Uh, you can see the, the swimmers would catch the fish on, on their nests. The fish would be, the nest would be marked and he would bring the fish to the boat where I would do the, the uh, manipulation. Here is what this fish face. So, they always, there are always other males and other species of fish that try to eat their eggs. So they are constantly monitoring the, the nests. And there is something, right? So if a fish is too aggressive and keeps uh, biting and protecting its nest, but neglects the oxygenation and the, the, the nurturing and the taking care of the offspring, they die. If a fish does not protect the nest, so, you know, the fish, the, the eggs would be eaten. So we have, a, this is a great example of a trade-off, right? So they cannot be too good at one and neglect the other, right? So this guy here is the male of the, the, the owner of the nest, and we have all of those around. So... Um, androgens are normally linked to aggressive behaviors. This is for 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 us biologists. We we even have examples from humans. Those studies from the nineties, I believe, that would say, ah, oh, in prison there are they have more testosterone and blah blah blah. Well, it actually is linked to aggression. To aggression. Here we have. If you, if you pay attention on the on the nest that's right in the middle, you can see that a female, she is in an horizontal position. She's laying her eggs, right? So um, something that we, we that is, you know, there is a bias when it comes to hormones. There are way more studies with birds and mammals than with the other groups. So here, we have that. We have, let's say, we don't have only testosterone that will influence the aggressive behaviors. We have more than that. So all the box, this is a very convoluted slide that nobody wants to present. Nobody should tell you about this slide. But what's important here is you can look and see the the red boxes before i go on sorry the red boxes they are the main androgens and you can see that wherever there is an arrow can be a point of regulation more than that some of these androgens they will bind to the androgen receptor so it won't be only testosterone 11kt can bind and others so which complicates our research, right? So this, this is hell for, for hell that you're looking at. That's hell. Um, so moving on, 
On the other hand, we have that prolactin has been linked in mammals with the onset of maternal and paternal behaviors, right? So we know that it will induce uh, uh, lactation in, in, in females. And here we have another example of fish. So this is the discus fish. And the discus fish, they produce kind of a, a, a nutri um, nutritious substance on their, in their skin, and the babies will bite. And uh, uh, it's it's as they, they it's it's almost a milk-like uh, substance, right? Full of nutrients and some other other functions as well. Um, in birds, we know that in, in in pigeons, pigeons will regurgitate what something that we call crop milk, and the babies will also uh, be nurtured by that, right? So we have examples that prolactin will influence behaviors in other groups, not only as in mammals, that will be related to nurturing, right? Not only the production of substances, but behaviors as well. Well, as I, I mentioned before, uh, bluegill will build nests, these nests are in colonies, they will build and defend these nests, and then during this time we know that concentrations of one of the androgens is very high. This androgen is 11-KT, 11-ketotestosterone. However, testosterone is also present, but it seems to be less influential when it comes to behaviors. Basically, when they this is a side anecdotal experience, right? This is not science. I, I will just ask you to indulge me. So, in the eighties, they would describe this fish as as being in their nests for up to ten days. We don't see that anymore. This anecdotal, not science. Remember. So my experience in this, these years that I was in the fields, in the same lake they were, is that fish will leave their nets, let's say, in five days. So what I, what I did was, on the day they were spawning, it would be my day zero. The day after, we would see eggs, and that's when we would start telling behaviors and collecting the fish. You can see, I just selected this picture. You can see the eggs at the bottom of the nest, right? We, we, we also, we do an estimation of how much the, the nest is covered. And we tried to link that to behaviors or to uh, how, how rate of abandonment, but we couldn't, uh, but that's, that's for later. But it's pretty cool to see eggs, right? Um, here we go. After the eggs hatch, the fish would spend more days taking care of the, the fry, right? Circulation uh, androgen 11KT levels will decrease during these days. This is well described, right? So, and it makes sense, right? So in the first, when they are building the nests and fighting for females, concentrations of androgen is high. When they're taking care of the eggs, that's not really important anymore. But these fish, sometimes they can uh, build another nest right after. Um, here is how we would we mark the nests. And here is one of my teams uh, at CUBES. CUBES is the Queen's University Research uh, Center facility station <laughs> um as i said right so we had a swimmer he would bring the fish to the to the boat here i would um, start the the hormone manipulation i would give the fish some time to recover and then they would be placed back in their nest i will describe this better soon so about gene expression 
and and so I will I will end up telling the the I will tell you the end of this story now, right? So this is an this is the part of the experiment that I think it's dated. So we have here a fish brain, the telencephalon, a mesencephalon, and we have uh, the preoptic area. So the POA is an area of the brain that's related to sexual dimorphi dimorphism. We have that, uh, men and women have uh, a difference in the concentration of cells in this area, for example. And this area is also related to parental care behaviors in, 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 the, in several uh, taxa. Uh, it's part of the hypothalamus, right? So what else should I mention here? Well, just just to try to make this, this more interesting. So in mice, when this area uh, is artificially, when, when, when science, when researchers damage this area, uh, the females will abandon their offspring. They they won't uh, they they just abandon or they even kill the 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 babies, right? So there is strong evidence of that. So the the last part of this 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 uh, research was we have we have that hormones will influence the activity in the preoptic area of the hypothalamus. Hormones will influence behavior. And there is also research that link androgens and prolactin to the immune response. So in mammals, there are there, there are several uh, articles that say, okay, so when females are pregnant, their immune system, uh, their immune response increases. And when males or and females as well have high levels of testosterone, uh, the immune system, the, the immune response decreases. So this is another question we asked, right? So here is kind of how we visualized this research, how I visualized this research, right? So we have androgens related to aggression and secondary uh, sexual characteristics, but that will cause as a collateral effect a decrease in the immune response. And we have prolactin that would do the opposite, right? But also linked to sexual characteristics, secondary sexual characteristics or expression. We can discuss that later. It's a different story, right? So one of the hypotheses that we tested is the Im immunocompetence handicap hypothesis. So this proposes that testosterone will decrease or will inhibit the immune response. If testosterone does that, and in fish, testosterone is not the most important androgen, our hypothesis, not only our, but a few other researchers, investigated as well. If 11-KT is the most important androgen, does it have an effect in the immune response? Well, and here are two fish where they would, uh, uh, we would also look, we would look at in indexes on their appearance. It's, it's, I didn't do this work. This is more with discus fish, right? Well, and the whole thesis, the whole, the whole work is androgens will increase the number of aggressive behaviors, decreasing nurturing behaviors, and prolactin we have the opposite effects, increasing nurturing, decreasing aggressive. And as I just mentioned, the contrasted, the contrasting effects on the immune system. Here we have another year uh, of, of research that was done at uh, Queens. So this was about the trade-offs related to these two hormones and their effects on behavior, gene expression, and immune response. So parental care. So uh, uh, this, this, this is the paper, but let's move on. So we do know that androgen stimulates aggressive behaviors. 
prolactin nurturing. What we don't know is, are androgens involved in aggression in this fish specifically? What about prolactin in fish? There is not, there are not many articles about that. And then do androgens mediate the trade-off between these two behaviors? So we have that there, there are uh, there is research pointing to a yes on both uh, answers. And let's see what I found. So I had five groups in this in this experiment. I used a control where I just inserted ca castor oil. You know, I used those um, elastic implants. They are basically uh, used in, in medicine where they would leak the hormones gradually into the fish, right? So the fish would be brought to the boat. I would, prefer, uh, the, it, the fish would be anesthetized. I would remove two scales and, and make a small incision. For this incision, I would in, I would insert um, the implant was about uh, four or five mill millimeters with the, the, the treatment inside, right? I would seal with liquid band-aids. The fish would recover for a few minutes and then the fish would be brought back to the nest. I measured the hormones before and after. So on this was day one where I collected the fish injected the implants and collected blood. Two days later, I would grab the same fish, collect blood, and then uh, sacrifice the fish, collecting its brain and uh, had kidneys for the immune response. Right, so I had these treatments, control. I had the 11KT, my, my most interesting group, right? Flutamide, it's an 11-KT antagonist. And then I had two concentrations of prolactin because we didn't know uh, which one would be more appropriate. And then I had bromocryptin, that is a prolactin uh, release inhibitor. It's, uh, it's, uh, we react on dopamine, decreasing the release of prolactin. So, this is just a diagram showing spawning day is the day that we would observe fish mating. I know that sounds weird, but and it is weird. But yes, and then the next day, I would do the implanting, followed by two days of behavioral observation. This is how we measured aggressive behaviors. One of the swimmers would. I we would collect uh, pumpkin seeds. Uh, it's another species really close to bluegill, and we would place it on the edge of the nest. During a minute, we would count the different types of aggressive behaviors that I will describe on the next slide. And here we have the, the description and the results. Well, first, the fish, the, the owner of the nest would do what we call lateral displays. He, the fish would literally be in front of the aggressor showing how big he is, right? And then he would do a purple flares with, with its fin and then um, a purple flare with, sorry, right? My mistake. And then he would also bite the intruder. Um, this was as predicted, right? So we have that the 11 KT group is the group that uh, exhibited a higher number of aggressive behaviors. The lowest were the prolactins that were similar to the control, right? So great, I was happy, uh, and they kept going. So what else did we find? So flutamide, the androgen antagonist, no effect. That's consistent with uh, what's found in, in other groups, such as mammals, lizards, and other fish. Um, evidence comes mostly from brain, from 
birds, right? So that's why we use it for termites. But the mechanisms that at least up until uh, some time ago, they were not known how it acts. Here, we have nurturing behaviors. We had one hour uh, across two days of nurturing behaviors, right? So pectoral fanning would be oxygenating the eggs with their fins, caudal fanning, and then egg removal, he would eat and spit eggs that were moldy. Um, interesting, we, it also uh, followed the theory, I was even happier, we have here that the hyperlactin group was the group that exhibited a higher number of nurturing behaviors, All right? What's interesting about this fish? Well, first, only one, uh, only the male is taking care of the offspring, right? The females are not there anymore. So there is no, uh, we are not, there, there is no this, con this confounding aspect that we see in other animals that you have both parents taking care of the offspring. We don't see it here, right? Um, and I lost track. Let's see the next slides. I'll find them myself. So here we have, ah, by the way, we use it ovine prolactin. It has shown to have effect in, in salmon and some other fish and uh, three-spined sticklebacks as well, right? So prolactin, good results. And then bromocryptin, the, the dopamine agonist, so inhibiting prolactin, they did decrease their nurturing behavior, and we found a similar uh, effect. It's just pointing out that we had a lower dosage, but then we had a different type of implants, right? And normally in these studies, they make pills or they give fish injections. Uh, we had a slow, a slow leaking, uh, a slow release in plants, right? So in this graph, we can see that aggressive behaviors on the y-axis, nurturing behaviors on the x-axis. And we can see that, yes, there is a trade-off between these two behaviors. Right, so the fish that they are too aggressive, they are less nurturing and vice versa. It cannot be attributed to competing allocations of time, right? Because we presented an, a, another fish to the, to, to the parental male. And then there is no compensation of the female, right? As we see in other groups. So for this, my thesis, Everything was confirmed. I was super happy. And then uh, what I wanted to know was the underlying mechanisms of how these hormones will influence these behaviors. Which genes are actually uh, being overexpressed or, or being inhibited? So that was my next question. So the optic area of the hypothalamus. Uh, high concentration of steroid hormone receptors related to sexual and parental behavior. And there is that sexual dimorphism that I mentioned before. I listed a hundred uh, or so candidate genes. Out of this a hundred candidate genes, I found exactly zero uh, differences between the treatments. Right? So we did... Uh, uh, I'll describe in the next slides, but what we did was uh, I wanted to have a, a transcriptome profile of each treatment during the time they were exhibiting parental care, right? So for this, I only used three groups, control, 11KT, and prolactin and the same structure of research. This was, if I look back, if I go back in time, this, I attribute this decision. Well, let's say, let me rephrase that. I would say that my decision of using the whole uh, area of the fish 
instead of trying to get the preoptic carrier by itself, was one of the things that, uh, let's say, didn't help with my results, right? So I do believe that if you if I was able to grab only the pre the preoptic area, these results would have been way more interesting than what I obtained. So I told you 2017, what we used was Illumina, uh, next next seek 500. 20 individuals in, divided by those three treatments. And we used two, actually, we used two uh, methods for to assemble the transcriptome and to analyze the, the genes, the gene expression. We used the Oyster River protocol and Trinity as well. Uh, so what's our, what, what, our, what I'm talking about, differential gene expression on the full transcriptome and on candidate genes. So this is just uh, uh, an idea of what we found. So we produced about 280,000 transcripts and then 89,000 uh, with complete coding sequences. We filtered and we kept going, right? Uh, list of candidate genes. So I looked into what had been done in fish and other groups and said, okay, this, these genes might be, uh, might respond to, a, 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 to an increase in testosterone in 11KT and or prolactin. So um, these, these are just the, the, the numbers. But, and I won't bother you with this. Let's go straight to the results. No genes were differentiated, differently expressed, sorry. Right, so here we have that there is no pattern. This is a PCA on, on the expression of the, of the genes in the three groups. Nothing, there is no, uh, we can't group anything, right? The, the three groups are all mixed and spread out. No transcripts as well. I know that the prolactin ones are a little bit different, but no statistical, nothing justifies it. So here we have a heat map based on the top 100 expressed genes from the full transcriptome. No clustering, no grouping, nothing. Right, uh, uh, I'll keep going. Again, uh, here, 100 expressed transcripts, nothing, nothing. I'll keep going. Yeah, so basically what I'm trying to say is, this was the, the, the most important part of the, this research of this PhD, right? So nothing, and then nothing again. <laughs> um, so, what do I what do I attribute that to? Maybe if a transcriptome, if if the expression of RNA is a snapshot of the genes being expressed, one of the reasons is that might be that I collected the fish hours after I, I made the fish really angry, right? So maybe the 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 genes were not overexpressed anymore. And for nurturing, we assumed they were exhibiting behaviors when all the time, right? So maybe prolactin takes longer than three days to act. There are studies that they use 16 days in other fish. Uh, so maybe that, that was another uh, source of error. Uh, maybe they, they weren't over expressing over expressing any desired behaviors. Maybe it was due to the difference of these two hormones, right? So we have steroids uh, and we have prolactin. So androgens are steroids based hormones and prolactin is a protein. And, and I think selecting the whole mesencephalon and diencephalon created a lot of noise when we were comparing groups. 
and this was something that uh, sharing, I, I was being pushed because I, we spent at the time thousands and thousands of dollars and resources to get these results done. So uh, the push was, we have to find something. Yeah, like if you squeeze the data, it will tell you something, but not necessarily, uh, not necessarily what it should tell you, right? So on the immune response, it's the last uh, bit. So um, here we have also it was this was another uh, chapter. So we have a schematic of the immune system here. We have innate immunity, right? So this uh, just a refresh. Uh, uh, so we have skin any any type of non-specific uh, response and then acquired immunity is what's interesting for us because we could we measured uh, immunoglobulins that the fish were were exhibiting right so we have the ic age age is the immunocompetence handicap hypothesis that's uh, proposes that androgens will in inhibit the immune response and the immune response will inhibit androgens. They, they don't go well together according to that. Evidence is not overwhelming. Uh, and lately, there are more and more, uh, there, is, there are more and more researchers saying that, yeah, this, this hypothesis doesn't have the support or I didn't find the support uh, I didn't find data that supports this hypothesis, right? Um, something that's confounding here is that each article you go to, they measure different immunoglobulins or they measure different cells or they, they, they look things differently. So we can't really compare. Prolactin and immune response, great. They work well together according to the theory, but we don't know that much in fish. What I the proceed the, the groups for this uh, experiments were divided in two. I would have half of the control group being vaccinated uh, with a Vibrio vaccine. It's a, it's a um, it's it's a common uh, vaccine for this type of studies, and this fish didn't have any contact with Vibrio before, because it's more of an ocean. Uh, um, infection. And we had a control where we just injected saline solution for the three treatments, right? Vaccination was day one, retrieval day three. Here uh, I am trying to take, uh, trying to bleed the fish. It's uh, we bleed the fish taking blood from an artery that's close to the spinal cord, so you have to Insert the needle very, uh, it's horrible. It took me a few years to learn that skill, which is a very marketable skill, right? I, I, I hear very, I, I look at very, a lot of job postings asking for candidates that can bleed fish. Um, so control and vaccine, what did I measure? Number of granulocytes, lymphocytes and monocytes and expression of one interleukin. Just a picture of red, of just a picture of blood smears. So we have here in A, we have a thrombocyte and one lymphocyte, one granulocyte in B, and finally two lymphocytes in C. Again, I'm repeating this the, the treatment. And let's keep going. Right? So we found here that. 11KT has no effect on the expression of IL-8. Prolactin, no effect at all. Monocyte count, nothing. But this is a good nothing, right? This, uh, opposed to my fishing expedition in, in the brain, this was more, uh, this is more interesting, I think. Granulocyte counts, no results. They don't affect that. Oh, what about lymphocytes? Nothing. 
which is pretty cool. So we, did, we didn't find any support for the, the theory. This theory has been proposed in the 90s, I believe, and people kept, people keep uh, working on it. So 11KT did, did not affect the innate immune response and did not affect the acquired immune response. Right, so our this this study, my study, does not support this hypothesis, and we are uh, let's say uh, adding data to a group of other studies that say yeah, th this doesn't work. So here we have that androgen. This is just a summary. Androgen does not influence the immune system in fish, according to my measurements. And prolactin is the same thing, right? Some other studies, they use, uh, as I mentioned before, right, injections or pills. So here we have a summary of the immune response. And finally, uh, a summary of the whole study, right? We were able to alter concentration of the hormones we were able to see effects of these hormones in behavior while the fish were on their environment. Um, for the, the, I didn't mention this before because it was not relevant, but for the gene expression uh, experiment, we had, we chose the most aggressive fish from the testosterone group, and we chose the most nurturing fish from the uh, prolactin group. We were trying to get real differences between gene expression, and we failed miserably. We didn't produce a transcriptome. Well, sorry, we did produce a transcriptome. However, no differentiation, differential, differential gene expression. <clears throat> Uh, and we did not find any, we did not find any mechanisms in the preoptic area, right? Um, about the immune system, we were successful in that. Here is the the a summary of the thesis, the whole study, and finally. 11KT alone does not fully explain, ag explain aggression in fish. Testosterone is also uh, a good one to study. 11KT role in aggression has been established in several fish, and we know that sometimes testosterone does not correlate to high aggressive fish in uh, ag high aggressive fi other, in other species, right? About the transcriptome, Something I like to mention is that, like, we cannot uh, uh, forget about phylogeny, right? When you're talking about birds, we are talking about a monophyletic group that, uh, let's say, is way, way more close, more, more comparable. I mean, uh, if we compare two species of birds, they are more closely related then if we compare fish, uh, let's say, then we can do a comparison in fish, right? Uh, the divergence in fish occurs way, way, way more back in time than in birds. It's about 400 million years ago, right? So think about that when it comes to comparing behavior and, and genes. <clears throat> um, so the transcriptome can be used for other studies. I was not, uh, I, I, I obtained no differences. And then um, I mentioned before, right? Maybe we should add more prolactin and I'm aware of the time. That's why I'm talking too much and fast. Um, more studies with prolactin, prolactin needs to be done. Basically, concentration, how it acts, and measuring prolactin after. Uh, about the immune response, there are so many factors that can influence it when we are talking about a fish 
in the wild that, uh, uh, let's say, can explain my results. But uh, most of these things are there when we are comparing uh, behaviors and, and other factors in the field, right? So that's why we collect a big number of animals and that's it. Um, and then finally, I say, well, uh, uh, broader number of measures. This is a good suggestion for future studies. So that's the immune system. So that we take a, a, a bigger picture of the immune response, not only a few, uh, immunoglobulins, not only a few types of cells, but everything that we can. And that is the last hypothesis that these are super fish. They can be nurturing and aggressive at the same time. So no trade-off, right? Well, um, I hope this presentation helped you guys in something. Something that I didn't mention was there was a strong push that the, the this is before I switched supervisor. Like how come my data did not support the immunocompetence hypothesis? So I counted the the, the blood uh, cells, and they also asked for a, another researcher to count because they didn't believe the, that nothing was there. Um, and about the, the the gene expression, the same thing, right? So there was this push that was kind of like, there has to be a difference. Yeah, no, it doesn't, right? We know that science is like that. I'll stop talking. I talked too much, sorry. <laughs> no, you definitely didn't talk too much, Adriano. Um, and thank you so much for that presentation. Um, and if anyone has a few questions, we have some time and you can either drop them in the chat or um, unmute yourself. I'll be monitoring the chat box, so. Um, and well, I have a quick question while we're waiting, if that's all right. And honestly, I'm just curious for you to continue expanding upon how you dealt with um, these pressures of kind of like squeezing data where you weren't getting results um, just because as young researchers, it seems oftentimes that's how science is sometimes valued, but is not always necessarily the case. So yeah, I'm just curious if you can expand on that a little bit more. Um, uh, basically, so when I said that it, it took me eight years to finish this PhD, um, basically I, most of these years were analyzing data, right? So the, the first experiment was easy. We, we got the results quickly we were, everybody was happy with, but then the rest, um, I was, I was trying to publish the new results of the the immune immune response, and uh, uh, the my supervisor wouldn't clear it, and then my thesis was the same thing, right? So it was how come there is nothing there, um, and this is something. And my decision, and looking back, after the four years that I was funded, I I said okay, so. I'll, I'll work while I do my PhD. And then during the first year, I published one of the papers and then the thesis wouldn't go, the other papers wouldn't. We, we asked for help of several people about the transcriptome analysis. Nobody found anything, researchers that I respect. Uh, and then I, I, I decided I would switch supervisors. And this is something that on my first year, I, I I said, you know, maybe I should switch supervisors. And I said, no, I started, I have good results. And then seven years later, I did and I, I uh, ah, nothing happens, right? 
you move on. I, and I got like this new supervisor, which is uh, Scott McDougall Shackleton. He is a hormone guy. He works with birds. And he's one of the best human beings I have met in my life. Right? With um, When he looked at the paper I had written basically by myself, he looked and he said, no, 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 no. You just change the tone. You change the tone. In one month, uh, the, sub the submission had been approved. Yeah, wow. I'm, thank you for sharing that and your story. Because um, I feel like a lot of people are don't talk about their experiences enough in grad school like that. Um, so we've got a few more minutes. If anyone has any last questions, raise your hand and, or drop them in the chat. Um, or with that, we might call it. And thank you so much, Adriano. And I hope the rest of you have a wonderful weekend. So thanks. Thank you. Oh, and the same here. I hope everyone has a great weekend. Bye. Bye.